Welcome to Reading the Gospels Together, and today we're reading Acts chapter 7, one of the most important but difficult chapters in the entire book. Let's start with important. We know it's important because of the amount of space Luke dedicates to it. It's by far the longest speech in the book of Acts and in the Gospel of Luke, for all that matters. For Luke to give it so much time, it must be central to his story. Luke also gives, uh, goes to considerable pains in chapter 6 to introduce us to Stephen, laying the groundwork, repeatedly mentioning how wise and godly and spirit-filled Stephen is, making Stephen's words that come all the more powerful. His face was like an angel, Luke mentioned several times, meaning as with Moses, when Moses came down from the mountain bearing the law of God with his, with his face aglow, that Stephen's words, like Moses's, are coming straight from heaven too. From God's mouth to Stephen's ear, as it were. But you know what? It's a difficult speech. And to be honest, when we read it, we're not sure what all the excitement's about. We, as Christians in 20, what is it, first century Charlottetown, we're too far removed theologically and culturally to understand what Stephen's driving at. But the clue is in the charges made against him in chapter 6. Let me remind you, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law, for we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. So the charge is that Stephen is undermining the authority of the temple as the center of Jewish life and worship their primary connection with God, and that Stephen is therefore rejecting the core of the law which God gave to Moses. As such, Stephen's response, which we're going to hear, will deal primarily with whether or not God needs the temple in Jerusalem from which to be worshipped, and whether God can be confined to a particular place or land, and whether or not the Jewish people are the only people God is concerned with or whether or not they've been all that faithful to the covenant or law which they're accusing Stephen of violating in the first place. So, long speech, and here are Stephen's main points. Number one, the activity of God is not confined to the geographic land of Israel. Stephen points out that God spoke to Abraham way over in Mesopotamia and way over in Haran. He blessed Joseph in Egypt. He spoke to Moses in the desert near Sinai during the incident of the burning bush. He performed wonders and signs in Egypt, the Red Sea, the desert, and he gave his people the law at Mount Sinai. None of these things, says Stephen, happened in Israel, certainly not anywhere near the temple. Second, so worship of the activity of God is not confined to the geographic land of Israel. Secondly, Worship acceptable to God, worship acceptable to God is not confined to the Jerusalem temple. The burning bush was holy ground. Moses had to remove his sandals there. Moses encountered God in Mount Sinai and was, giving live and wor was given living words. The portable tent style tabernacle, which they took all over the desert with them in their wanderings, was a suitable place of worship for the people of Israel long before the temple was built. Stephen concludes that Everything necessary for pure worship was available to the people in the wilderness before they ever entered the Holy Land. The Jewish scriptures testify, Peter po uh, Stephen points out, that God does not dwell in houses made by human beings. And so, as the Most High does not live in houses made by men, Stephen's implying that to announce the suppression or destruction of the temple was not to commit blasphemy or sacrilege against God, because God was independent of any temple. Now, Stephen's final point is that his fellow Jews have constantly rejected God's representatives who sought to turn them onto the right path. Joseph was rejected by the patriarchs. Moses was rejected when he tried to intervene in a quarrel between two Jews. And yet, this Moses was sent as Israel's deliverer. The message of Moses they rejected and instead erected a golden calf. Stephen climaxes his message in vigorous language by claiming that Israelite history is a history of rejection of God's representatives. 
At this point, it appears as though Stephen has to end his talk abruptly because his audience has become too enraged to listen any further. So that's Stephen's speech in a nutshell. Now, you might notice that there's very little about Jesus, and there's a lot about Moses in this speech. That's understandable since the charge against Stephen is about his rejecting Moses' teachings. Stephen points out points to one significant thing that Moses said to the Israelites about Jesus. God will send you a prophet like me from your own people. The New Testament goes to great pains to show that Jesus is a prophet just like Moses. The other two references to Jesus are both in verse 52. The high priesthood and temple authorities, Stephen says, even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one meaning the prophets who over hundreds of years had come before, a charge Jesus made against the temple authorities as well, the prophets who came over hundreds of years before who were pointing to the coming of Jesus were killed by the temple authorities, those same authorities who put Jesus to death too. In short, Stephen's claim, his charge, he's being charged, but he makes a counter charge. His charge is that this temple and the whole religious priesthood and system built around it is not necessary to worship God. God can be worshipped anywhere, and not just in Israel. Faith and belief in Jesus the Messiah is the new pathway to God for all people anywhere. Jesus, as the ultimate, total, once and for all, final sacrifice, becomes the meeting point between God and the people. Anywhere. Not just in Israel, not just in the temple. Now, whether or not Stephen realized it or intended it, through this speech, he freed Christianity from the confines of the temple, where Christians, remember, had continued to worship, and he began the separation of Christianity from Judaism itself. And it would be just a short time later that the church concluded that one does not have to be Jewish first in order to be Christian. Those are Big, big world-changing concepts. And that's why Luke devoted so much time to this speech, which otherwise seems kind of incomprehensible to us. Those of us without Jewish theological knowledge or roots might not see the importance of it, but this transition from a, a Jerusalem-localized faith centered on the temple, adding only the recognition of Jesus as Messiah to traditional Jewish worship, to an international faith, freed from the temple system, freed even from the geographical restrictions of the land of Israel, is what enabled Christianity to spread throughout the world and to all people. In fact, the remainder of the book of Acts is nothing other than this very story. The main protagonist of this change, believe it or not, is waiting in the wings listening to this speech and not liking what he's hearing. Stephen, at the conclusion of his speech, has a vision of heaven with Jesus at the right hand of God, much the same vision Jesus himself had at the conclusion of his own trial before the Sanhedrin. This time, however, the Sanhedrin isn't going to run to Pilate. This time, they drag Stephen out of the city, stone him to death immediately. Again, after the manner of Jesus, whose death is being uh, it was foreshadowed by Jesus' own death, Stephen commends his spirit to God, or in Stephen's phrase, Lord Jesus, and he prays forgiveness for his assailants. Now, stoning somebody to death is hot and messy work, and his assailants laid their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul, who we are told approved of their killing him. Little did this young man know that it would be none other than he himself who would bring Stephen's speech to full reality, changing Christianity and the world with the vision of a faith for all people, of all places, for all time. And that begins tomorrow in chapter 8. We'll see you then.